resources, and it's a great resource for us, and I actually emailed it to all of you uh, before the meeting started. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Bill. Arlen? So we did just have our uh, North Cook meeting, our next meeting is in September. And primarily, uh, our uh, executive director brought us up to date on operational issues. Uh, he has spent most of the last couple of months dealing with COVID, uh, obviously. And, uh, but the good news is uh, we are in good financial shape and we have no forecasts of any issues for North Cook. Um, and so I have nothing, I'm gonna get you all a copy of the report so I don't have to dwell on it. I have nothing of great consequence other than the good news to report to you. I did want to touch on what Phil said about Sheila while I'm here. And it is as of two months ago or two months before she passed, Sheila was still coming to the um, Northwest Suburban Mental Health Task Force that I'm a member of. And she served on that all these years after leaving her role as mayor and supporting our efforts to build uh, supportive care facilities uh, for those with mental and physical disabilities. So. She continued to fight on, Phil, as you said, and uh, she's a lady to be proud of. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any other governmental agency updates, either Jessica or Stacy uh, and Stacy? Nope, nothing. Nothing here. Okay. That concludes our board communications. We'll move into staff communications. Superintendent's report, Dr. Conlon. Well, good evening, everybody. And um, I wanted to jump right into um, our conversation this evening uh, over the topic that we are all uh, most focused on right now, and that is the reopening of, of school for the 2020-21 school year. And so um, if you give me a moment, I am going to share my screen. Um, I do have a slide deck that I would like to, uh, to go through and just provide some, some updates to the board um, as it relates to our reopening uh, plans as they currently stand, as well as um, our uh, priority spending under the under the our CARE Act uh, allocation. So, um, just give me one moment while I get the right thing shared, and there we go. So, right now you should be seeing the the slide deck, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, one of the things that I just kind of wanted to spend uh, just a moment kind of in introduction is that, you know, one of the things that I think everybody understands is that this, uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic is going to have a profound impact on our educational setting, not only in, in District 21, but across the country. Um, there has been a lot of uncertainty. Um, and one of the things that we have been waiting uh, for uh, finally came this week, and that is the the guidance, uh, from, joint guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Department of Public Health. In October, excuse me, in, in April, um, we uh, uh, formed uh, the COVID-19 Educational Impact Task Force. Um, there are over 70 administrators and faculty members that are part of that task force, um, grouped into three working groups. Um, and they, uh, in their initial uh, meetings really generated some outstanding questions that then drove um, the administrative team to be able to begin to formulate very preliminary uh, reopening plans. And then there was a lot of hurry up and wait uh, as we waited for the state guidance to, to, to finally um, be uh, released. And so then again, that happened on June 23rd. We very quickly began to look at that guidance. And uh, we're very pleased that much of what is in our draft plan, and it's still very much a draft, um, is in pretty close alignment with what the guidance ended up being. Uh, so um, we are now working to um, really vet the, the, the draft, um, to, to, to have our task force respond to it, to poke holes in it to find um, those things that we need to um, uh, think more about, to, to uh, hear alternatives proposed, and then to, uh, in short order, uh, come to a final draft that then we can, um, you know, uh, make sure the board is, it has an opportunity to see and then release, um, hopefully, um, no later than the early mid part of, of July. Our primary goals um, as we look to the reopening is to make sure that we are implementing and adhering 
all of the, the uh, relevant health and safety recommendations and requirements um, contained within the joint guidance, that we are maximizing in-person instruction of students um, with our standard being every student, every day for a full day, that we are ensuring a, 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 a um, noted focus on the social emotional learning um, and the health and physical and mental uh, uh, and safety of everybody. Um, you know, we know that the past several months has been, um, you know, of devastating impact to many, uh, whether it be their own um, personal family experiences with COVID or the economic loss people have suffered, the disruption to normal routines and living. Um, we know that kids are going to come back and, and um, that there's going to be uh, a loss of community that we're going to need to reestablish. Um, that there's going to be a loss of routine um, and that we're going to need to work very hard and together with with our families and with our community to support our kids uh, and support our adults too. Uh, we are looking to maximizing the instructional focus to ensure that our, our children are mastering those critical learning skills, um, particularly in math and, and literacy. We know that there is going to be learning loss. We know that there will be gaps. We also know that some students may come back and will have accelerated. Um, because of the independent work that they may have been undertaking, um, you know, while they've been uh, away from school. And we also know that, um, you know, the challenges that we're going to see within a, a COVID school environment is going to cause us to need to really be creative in our problem solving to try and, and um, present as balanced and as normal um, of a learning environment as we can. And that ultimately it is very possible, if not probable, that we will go through periods of time when based on infection, um, we may see a need to return to a, a fully distance um, environment, learning environment, and that we are doing that as seamlessly as possible. Um, we were taken by surprise um, in, in March. Uh, we do not, we cannot be taken by surprise again. Um, and so, you know, we did an amazing job uh, in, in moving over to a virtual uh, distance platform, but now we know how to do it better. Um, and so to be ready uh, to do so at, quite frankly, a moment's notice is going to be um, a critical uh, piece of this. So here's what we know now as a result of, of taking a look at the state guidance. And uh, again, a lot of these things aren't necessarily going to be all that surprising. Um, we know that social distancing is going to be required on buses and in all school, er school areas to the greatest extent possible. Um, now that is going to vary based on uh, class size, class room size, uh, facility abilities. Um, and so we will do everything we can to be as close to the ideal of social distancing, knowing that there might be some areas where we won't be able to have that full six feet and that we are going to have to do a combination of mitigation efforts to, to uh, address that. We know that um, across the board, uh, there is a maximum while we're in phase four of 50 occupants. That's not 50 children, that's 50 occupants um, within a, a given space and on the bus. Um, classrooms, of course, will not hold, house 50 people. That is not what we're talking about. Uh, face coverings will be required to be worn at all times um, by everyone, by students and staff and visitors, except while outside and socially distanced. Um, there are going to be the, uh, we will be honoring medical exemptions um, at, for, for students um, a, as long as we have a doctor's note on file. Um, as I noted before, we are gonna do the very best that we can to maintain as normal a school day experience as possible. But the bottom line is the 2020-21 school day is going to look very different. Um, it has to. Uh, as I said, we are planning for a regular length school day, but the, one of the things that we are needing to take a look at is possibly um, looking at a scenario where our middle schools may need to start earlier um, than what they have in the past, and that's due to transportation. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, with the limited number of um, students that we can put on a bus, um, we're going to need more bus routes. 
and that's going to take longer to accomplish. And so by we're, our transportation folks, by looking at um, the time difference, seeing being able to move up the start times of our middle schools, we will generate more of that time that we need to safely and effectively get everybody who is riding a bus to school. Um, and again, we're, that is something that we're actively working on. And, and um, so that is not to say that that decision has been made concretely yet, but that is uh, certainly looking like where we are, uh, where we, we may be headed. Uh, I can't emphasize enough um, that the key to our success as a school district is going to hinge on our ability um, and our willingness to follow the science, um, to be agile, to be flexible, and to be ready to deal with the unknown. Um, it's going to be critical that we acknowledge and really embrace the fact that we're in a different world. This year is going to look very different than those in our past. And quite frankly, the only way we're going to really effectively get through it is to work together as a community um, and to really uh, provide as regular of an educational experience for our students as we can. Um, we know, particularly when we're talking about mitigation efforts, that, that there are concerns. Um, you know, we know that there are uh, parents who are very concerned about their children wearing uh, face coverings. Um, there are differences of opinion um, as to you know, whether the steps that we are taking uh, or being required to take are valid. Um, to be honest with you, you know, we are going to go where the science takes us and where the, where the, the, the uh, health, public health authorities direct us to go. Um, and uh, I respect everybody, uh, everybody in, their, in their, their thinking, but ours is pretty clear cut. We follow the regulatory agencies and what they um, what they recommend uh, that we do. So here are our next steps. Um, again, we are going to be continuing to review and 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 working to understand the ISB guidance. It's a 60-page long document. It is um, you know there's a lot in it. Um, we have scoured it, but the more we read it, the more we look at it, the more we talk through things, the more we're going to be able to have a better understanding of exactly what it's saying. Uh, we are in the process of reviewing and revising our draft reopening plan. Um, we had our uh, a, uh, educational impact task force meeting today. Uh, our various working groups are going to be meeting uh, virtually in the coming days to, to uh, do their um, really deep dive and review of the draft and, and, and uh, as I said, poking holes in it and proposing um, uh, potential alternate um, ideas. Once that is done, I am going to convene my superintendent's parent advisory council um, at, to review and uh, to advise on the, the draft reopening plan. And then finally, uh, once we have um, uh, the board have an opportunity to take a look and comment, um, our, our plan is to, to finalize and release that reopening plan as soon as possible, but again, with the, with the uh, target date of being that early mid uh, part of July. So if not the week after 4th of July, then early in the, the part of the, of the next week. Um, and I forgive me, I, I don't know the exact date there. Um, so I'll take a pause for a moment and see if there are any board members that have questions about this part of the of the presentation before I, I move on to CARE Act um, uh, uh, conversations. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Bill, just give me uh, a quick second. Mike, do you know whether or not the ISB um, uh, guidelines allow for the interchangeability of shields as opposed to other type of face coverings, masks? You know, face shields will be as acceptable? Yes. So um, we are, uh, it, it is very clear within the guidance that, that um, it is permissible for staff to be wearing face shields. In, in fact, our plan is to purchase face shields for our staff so that they can, you know, be seen. We believe, and when I say we, it's, it's kind of regionally as we are, are, are discussing this, and based on uh, what we heard from a webinar um, that the state board offered yesterday, that that is also permissible for students. And so that is the, the um, posture that we are taking. Um, unfortunately, it was a little murky um, in, in the, the actual guidance, but, but the consensus is, and then also based on what they said at the webinar, um, you know, from ISBE is that yes, indeed, 
face shields uh, may be worn by, uh, by children as well. Okay. And we would certainly support that um, and, and welcome that um, amongst our, if that's a, a, an acceptable alternative to our, our, our parents uh, than regular having a, a you know, face mask, uh, face covering. Thanks, Mark. That 60 pager is uh, quite something to behold. Uh, Bill, you got your hand up? Your mic's no. off, Bill. You're on mute, Bill. Thank you. I got it. There we go. Um, quick question for clarification, Mike. Uh, you talk about getting the document out to the public uh, the first, second week of July, but we're also talking about getting board input. Are we planning to have a meeting for that prior to your release? Well, I'm going to need to consult with Phil on that. Um, you know, it, it may very well be that, that um, you know, we can um, have you guys uh, take a look at it independently. And if we find that there is a, uh, a desire on the part of the board um, to come together and to have deeper discussions about this in, 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 an, in, a, in a meeting that we could organize a special meeting, um, it's not necessarily at least in its current form, a document that I, I feel needs um, specific board approval. Um, but so I, it's certainly a possibility and, and it's something that, that um, we're gonna need to, uh, to kind of work through. Um, the issue is, is that when our July board meeting is, if we're ready to go a little sooner, um, that would be better. Uh, it, it's just the, the more time we can give parents to actually uh, be able to read and review the document. Um, the better off we're going to be. I agree. That's why I asked the question the way I did. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I don't see any other board member hands. Arlen. Is, uh, Ian Arlen. So uh, on the question of approval, I think you're right, Mike. However, from a tacit point of view, uh, once that's published, people are going to come up to us and say, did you approve that? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we need to formally approve that. We just need to understand it all. Yeah, point taken. And, and again, it, it, I have absolutely uh, no problem uh, at all um, with uh, organizing a special meeting um, if that's the, the comfort of the board and, and Phil and, 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 and having that. Um, in fact, I, I don't see that that is a bad idea at all um, before it, it, it would go public. I mean, in essence, it's going to go public in that open board meeting uh, mm -hmm. because this, these are not subject to closed session conversations. So. Right, right, right. Uh, and my second point, uh, you talked in the document a lot, quite about the emotional side of things, rightly so. Uh, last year, we talked a great deal about trauma-based learning, Mike. Mm -hmm. So how does that get expanded into this since this year certainly would seem to be the time and the place for a lot of attention to trauma-based learning? Yes. So um, as you may recall, at the beginning of, of, of last year, in fact, during the summer of, of 2019, uh, each school um, form, formed a, a, um, uh, a, uh, a trauma uh, team, um, a uh, uh, trauma based, you know, so a committee of, of, of staff. And our actual title for it is, it, you know, is slipping my mind um, at this point. Resiliency team. Thank you. Um, and so those teams um, are active, they still exist. Um, each school had, oh, through the course of, of, of last year um, have engaged in a multitude of different activities around um, enhancing the staff's understanding, knowledge, and, 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 and ability to deal with um, students who have experienced trauma. Um, that work is only going to intensify. Um, and so, um, you know, we are looking uh, under uh, Kim Klein and, and, and her staff, and, the, and we're looking at, at, at a, you know, all kinds of different things that we may need. Uh, her team met last week um, to really go through some brainstorming about what are those things that we need to um, look at, what are, what are materials and, or, or resources that we need to acquire and, and, and get, you know, in place. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of PD, uh, book studies and other things of that nature that has gone on that will continue to go on. So um, it, in some ways, it's almost prophetic that we were doing this work. Um, it was absolutely needed, yep. irrespective of, of COVID. Um, but the fact that we are now experiencing this and have a year head start, uh, and we've got a long way to go, but a year head start on, on, on doing this work, I think will uh, help quite a bit. Yep, great. Thank you. Hey Mike, you want to proceed? 
So I think Stacy had something. I did, just real quick. Uh, two things. One, um, I have relayed some of my feelings about the reopening plan that the state provided to Dr. Conley. Um, I think there's just so much that we don't know more than we know, which is what makes me very uncomfortable about it. Um, you know, I'm having to make some decisions regarding both of my children on whether they're going to be able to go back into a classroom as I am um, someone that is on the list of people who should, you know, be nowhere near it. So there are some tough decisions that families are going to have to talk about and make. Um, and so I guess what I, two things I would hope as we wind through this and you guys get your feet underneath you and know what tough work it is, I started to read that 60 page document and well, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, but I would um, like a, a, as we make some decisions and formalize things, I would be very supportive of having an, another board meeting to have a more robust conversation. Um, and I'm, uh, there's no way I'm the only board member that's been contacted by about a half a dozen parents with um, concerns and fear and all of those things about the safety of their family. So um, I look forward to you getting that group together. But, you know, families are going to have some tough conversations to have. And, and you know, I, as, as we really have become this, you know, anchor for information, I, you know, I think we need to carry it through and make sure that we're doing the best that we can in reference to what the state wants, but also, you know, the Wheeling Prospect Heights, this area was hit fairly hard. Um, the positivity rates in Wheeling are still higher than they are in other areas. And so those factors do concern me as we have a lot of manufacturers and a lot of people who are uh, in what I would call high risk jobs. And so I think um, as the downstate districts have some uniqueness to the struggles that they deal with, um, I think it's important to note that this area did have a hard hit and we were impacted very um, significantly and, and families are feeling that. And so as we have these conversations, I just want to make sure those things are noted. Yes, agreed. And, and one thing I was actually remiss in, in, in mentioning as I was going through the initial um, kind of preliminary look is that we are uh, seriously uh, looking at and considering um, offering a an option for families uh, an open enrollment distance learning program for the, the coming school year. So those families of which you, you, you speak that are either uncomfortable with the concept of sending their children back uh, or they themselves have are immunosuppressed or, or are high risk uh, households um, that they have a quality alternative. Um, this is a, a, a distance learning program that would mirror um, as a matter of fact, in many ways, we're looking at, at upgrading some, some of our broadcasting and, and video technology to be able to uh, do some, some live streaming from live classrooms and things of that nature. But in any event, to mirror the, the instructional experience that our in-person kids are receiving, it will not look like what the, what the spring looked like uh, in terms of kind of the limited interaction. Um, you know, uh, but uh, um, in any event, that it is something that um, there is an, an alternative, a quality alternative operated by our staff, by our teachers. This is not we're going out and offshoring to some other virtual academy. Um, our people operating this, and we're working very closely with DEA um, and, and, and taking a look at how we can do that. And uh, as you'll see, you know, in, in just a little bit, um, there was interest in our in our most recent parent survey for that option. So we are absolutely looking to to try and make sure that that is um, available and operating. Thank you. I mean, they're hard decisions to make. I, you know, my kids will be doing their college online first semester because I have a condition of which I get it. I, you know, I it's not good. So. Um, I just want to make sure that we, in addition to following those, I respect the state of Illinois guidelines. I, you know, I have some of my own feelings about how that went down, but um, I also think we have to take into consideration the kind of community that's reflected here um, and, and take those really very real day-to-day -day concerns into consideration. And I, I appreciate you saying that because I think that does give some people some cause to breathe a little easier. Agreed. Thank you. I think Arlen had one more thing, but your mic is off, Arlen. Arlen. 
Um, I did. And as long as we're looking at the possibility of, allow, uh, of allowing and providing for parents who do have concerns about sending a child to school or have immune issues, um, I would suggest that maybe we should also look at when we get back into full board meetings, somehow making that uh, uh, opportunity available to, the, to individuals and voters to follow our meeting. I know that's more complex, but it might be something we should look at. Well, to that point, uh, Arlen, I did ask Mike Frantini to begin to investigate what kind of uh, equipment in uh, video equipment and, and live streaming equipment we would need in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. um, and he is working on those things. And it was my intent to uh, bring that, um, at, you know, once I talked to Phil, because Phil hasn't even heard this yet, um, <laughs> to uh, uh, bring that as a discussion point in our July meeting. Um, and uh, so, you know, if that is a, a, a desire of the board that we would be able to offer that, um, you know, as, as soon as we can, you know, get the, you know, the technical um, aspects of it worked out. Yeah, I think it's, from my perspective, absolutely the right thing to do and the transparency that this world requires. Make, make sure you bring us the cost with it, Mike. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Are, are you still sharing your screen? Or do you... Yeah, yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to uh, uh, talking about uh, our, our priority spending um, plans for the CARE Act. Uh, okay. The CARE Act, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the CARE Act obviously is the second stimulus package that the, uh, was passed by Congress earlier this spring. Um, as a result of that allocation, um, the state has, uh, has um, allocated $1.038 million uh, in funds to District 21. Um, those funds are intended to support um, our district in meeting the increased costs that we will incur, uh, both in education and operation um, during the pandemic. Uh, we are um, uh, working on finalizing a, an initial uh, CARE Act spending plan, which will then be submitted to the Illinois State Board of Education for their approval. Um, that spending plan may be amended as necessary. Um, and so as we see perhaps shifting priorities, we can go back in and, and reallocate um, as necessary. Uh, those CARE Act funds uh, must be expended in full by September 30th of 2021. So these are funds that are designed to carry us through from now all the way up until that point. Um, just to kind of go for a, a quick summary of what our priority spending is, I've divided this into two categories. Um, our first category being health, safety, and operational expenditures. Um, obviously a large portion um, at this point of the allocation, uh, approximately $300,000 at this moment, um, we are looking at for the purchasing of necessary uh, PPE, uh, personal protective equipment for staff and students, um, the face shields, uh, uh, single use um, masks, gowns, uh, gloves, um, you know, all of those different types of, of things. Um, you know, the purchasing of materials and signage to, um, you know, support the social distancing, uh, at, you know, in our facilities, as well as making sure that um, we have signage about, you know, hand washing prompts and uh, what uh, COVID symptoms look like, you know, are before, you know, people enter in, they can, you know, be reminded of those things. Um, so all of those different types of, of, of signage. Uh, we have already been purchasing um, additional health and safety equipment, uh, infrared thermometers. Um, again, like I said, the, the, the different uh, kinds of, of PPE. Um, so uh, again, a big portion is a, a purchasing of additional cleaning and sanitation equipment. We have already purchased a good a deal of, of some of these things through some monies that we got from FEMA um, in particular. Uh, we have purchased for each building um, a, an ionizer. Um, with, I kind of like to call it a, a disinfection bomb, um, where it literally, uh, you know, you, you put it in a classroom, it, it projects um, kind of ionized disinfectant and, and just adheres um, to all surfaces and, you know, uh, disinfects it in one fell swoop. In addition, each building will have three, um, I kind of like to call it the Ghostbuster gun, um, where it's the backpack and, and, and they actually literally have the misting um, of the, the disinfectant, kind of you see it on the, the, uh, the airplanes as they're kind of walking up and down the aisles. Each building will have three of those. Um, and uh, then obviously hand sanitizer and, um, you know, the, um, 
hand sanitizer as much as we can get, uh, hand washing equipment, um, you know, all of the, you know, uh, uh, safety equipment for the bathrooms, uh, plexiglass, um, you know, for the, the reception areas and things of that nature. Many of these things are already being installed, um, but those are all um, purchases that will be going through. Um, Michael just sent me a message that uh, each of the nurses' offices will also have um, a, uh, is that a wand or a, a, a stationary um, uh, unit, Michael? A wand, okay. Um, so um, each of the nurses' office will have one of those disinfecting wands. Uh, which is going to be critical because if we we have a, a a student that is exposed or a staff member that's exposed, we are going to have to you know do some some very immediate deep disinfection, and in fact even shut that area down for at least 24 hours before we are able to utilize it again based on the guidance. Uh, we know that. Uh, we are going to need to purchase additional supplies and learning manipulatives because this is not a situation where we are going to be able to share supplies. Um, and so as we're looking at math manipulatives, as we're looking for, you know, looking at pens and pencils and things of that nature, it really is going to need to be for an individual student. Um, and so we are going to need to purchase additional um, kits uh, of those types uh, to support the, the learning inside the classroom. Um, and then as we, this is just a description, there are other items that haven't been captured in here, but um, as we move to category two, uh, we really look at it from a purchase service and a human resources perspective. Um, we know that um, we are going to need to really kind of uh, make some additional learning tools and support tools available, um, both for in-person use as well as distance um, learning usage. Uh, you know, another item on the agenda here is, is the expansion of power school uh, systems, uh, which is inclusive of um, our Schoology uh, school um, student LMS system. Uh, something that will make it much more seamless. Um, it's basically Google Classroom on steroids, um, you know, to uh, kind of not, not just use for our, our in-person, in but also for um, the distance learning and the transition between. Um, that's for our um, grades three through eight, uh, grades K2, sometimes three. There's another one called Seesaw. Um, we will continue to utilize that. Um, we um, We'll be bringing in a new assessment platform, um, a, uh, a data analytics and assessment platform called Performance Matters um, that will very much support our ability to um, uh, measure uh, our academic progress, both in person and remotely and across the board, you know, more common assessments, uh, which is a priority within our strategic plan irrespective of COVID. Um, so that's kind of a win, um, you know, in, in, in both ways. Uh, we are going to need to place bus supervisors um, on our buses. Um, you know, it is simply unreasonable to expect a single bus driver um, to be able to ensure that, or try and ensure that kids are social distancing on the bus, that they're, you know, follow, that they're wearing their face coverings, that they're following safety procedures. Um, and so we will need to place supervisors on our buses. Um, and so that is going to be an added expense. Um, our buildings are going to need additional custodial uh, support, particularly in the evenings, um, because of the level of deep cleaning and disinfection that we are going to need to do. Um, and so we are working very closely with DEA to um, you know, ensure that we are able to um, bring in that additional, albeit temporary, and when I say temporary, I mean for the next school year or until we move beyond this uh, uh, pandemic um, to make sure that we are able to do that and in due deference to the collective bargaining agreement. Um, we are going to have much higher supervision uh, needs, um, you know, particularly at the elementary schools. And so as we're looking at um, safely getting the kids inside, um, making sure that we're not congregating in areas, um, if we have movement that needs to occur, um, being able to escort um, uh, kids to and from where they need to go, we're gonna have a lot more lunch um, uh, periods, um, whether they're in the classroom or in other locations, we're gonna need additional supervising for that. Um, and we're just gonna need more um, more people, more adults to be able to, to make sure that we are uh, maximizing um, our safety net here. In addition, um, we are going to need additional health office staff, uh, particularly in the elementary. 
Um, we have RNs um, and health assistance. We have CSNs that, that you know, travel between buildings. Simply put, with our elementary buildings having one secretary and one health aide, it's not enough. Um, they are going to need additional assistance in that health office. Um, and um, that's not to say that the middle schools are not on our radar for that, but to be honest, the middle schools have a lot of support in their offices. Um, they have two secretaries, there's a dean, there's a health assistant, there's an assistant principal and a principal. And so our priority right now is making sure that our elementaries have the manpower that they need. And if we find that middle schools need additional assistance, we will, you know, we will meet that need. Um, but uh, right now, um, we need to make sure that, that our, our elementary schools are taken care of. Um, finally, uh, within CARE Act, uh, we are going to be seeking to employ a district contact tracer. Um, this is somebody who will be on staff, who will be uh, preferably an RN and or somebody with a public health background um, that will be able to support the school nurses um, in uh, uh, coordinating um, our COVID mitigation. If we do have an exposure that they are able to make the contact with families, make the contact with whomever um, may have been exposed by that, they're also able to coordinate with local and, and state public health agencies. Um, that way, our um, school nurses and our school health assistants can focus on kids um, and taking care of them while some of the logistical, you know, kind of, again, that whole coordination piece is being handled uh, by, this, by this contact tracer. Uh, finally, in addition to CARE Act funds, um, we are going to leverage our federal Title I, Title II, Title IV, and then other state and local resources. Um, to provide the additional support that we are going to need, particularly to address um, the uh, learning loss and the learning gaps that we know we are going to encounter uh, specifically. Uh, and this would be coming out of Title I and local funds to ensure that there's equity and all elementary schools have this service available to them. Um, we are seeking to employ um, reading and literacy interventionists uh, in all uh, elementary schools. Um, this, again, right now is for the coming school year. Um, we will need to, as a district, take a look at, our, at the state of our finances, take a look at our state of ability to, to maintain um, a position of that nature. We've always wanted a position of that type, um, but, you know, I can't make those guarantees. But what I do know is we're going to need them this year, uh, particularly on our elementary schools. Um, the, the, uh, the learning to read and, and not losing that skill, um, having those skill deficits is closed is critical um, to the success of those students um, in later years. Again, that's not to say that we're not concerned with the middle school. We will absolutely be looking at what kind of supports middle school needs. Um, but to be honest, the kids in the elementary school are learning to read. For the most part, kids in, in, in uh, middle school are, are sharpening their reading skills um, and they're reading to learn. So, um, you know, the critical need is really at that, from an educational perspective, starts in that elementary um, area. As I noted before, uh, we are looking at those video conferencing and live streaming equipment that we can be utilizing in classrooms. Um, we are looking at a very uh, promising system that 214 is actually installing in their classrooms. Frantini is, is um, you know, uh, actively uh, investigating that and it, is, it does look very promising. What's going to be uh, key about this is that then those students that are distance learn learning can be part of a live classroom, um, as well as, quite frankly, after this is all over, if we have a child who is homebound because they have leukemia um, and they are on chemo and they can't be in the classroom. Well, yeah, they can be in the classroom because we set that puppy right up in the, in, in the classroom and they're part of it. So this is a, not just for now. This is something that will be quite beneficial for us in the future. And as I said, um, the resources we will need for SEL supports um, or additional professional development for mental health and then um, really directed support for the mental health needs of our, of our students, staff, um, and families. So that was a lot, um, but I, uh, uh, you know, kind of giving a, a, a snapshot of where we are now. And if there are any questions about CARE Act, um, we, can, uh, we can tackle those. I just have two. Mm -hmm. Um, for the extra nursing support in the elementary buildings, do you have a, 
a, an education level that you're looking at for what they need to have in order to be that extra support? Yeah, we would be looking uh, preferably at somebody who has, at the very least, a, a CNA um, or an LPN or certainly an RN. You know, it, it, it um, depends on, on what the candidate pool, but we would be looking for someone who has that, uh, at least a CNA um, in, in that kind of, of uh, credential. We just were rich in those in the area because uh, Wheeling High School has a really great CNA program, so. And that's who we'll be reaching out to to get a candidate. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Um, and then if, if we said that in the meeting last year, I said, we've got CNAs that just graduated from high school. Let's go after them, so. And then as far as the contact tracing is concerned, are you guys working? I know a lot of area uh, people are working with um, Lake County who apparently has a for contact, tra contact tracing through the state? Um, we're going we're gonna to reach out to, um, obviously, uh, not being in Lake County, the, I don't know how tight that resource is, but we are going to reach out to uh, our local you know, departments of public health to try and, and, and find somebody. But I really want somebody of our own. Um, I, I don't want to be sharing um, with another agency. I want them for us full time. So, I think they're doing some training. That's all I was talking about. I think they're oh, doing some very specific training for agencies in the area on contact tracing. I think Lake County Health Department is actually spearheading heading that. Okay. Um, I, I was talking to them today. So. Yeah, that's good to know. I will definitely look at that. Yep, that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Arla? Your mic's on, off, Arla. Um. Are we planning every day to take everybody's temperature when they arrive at school? Uh, we are having conversations about that. Um, you know, that is something that um, the, the, in the state guidance um, uh, is either um, that we are doing it or we may have a protocol of parents certifying that they have uh, screened their children. Um, we are having conversations about that. Um, you know, I can tell you that um, the, the logistical challenge of um, screening 6,500 kids mm -hmm. every single day is daunting um, to the point of not entirely certain um, that we would be able to do it um, in, in addition to the fact that if we're doing that, we're also looking at needing to uh, put up things like extended canopies from all of our different entrances in the event that it's inclement weather. Uh, we would need to be setting up isolation areas, um, which we will be doing anyway, but we would need more of them um, in the event that, you know, so it, there's a lot of, of um, uh, nuance there that we need to look at. Um, I will tell you that Quite frankly, the temperature taking is somewhat of an area of diverge, you know, you know, like dissonance um, as to how effective and how meaningful that actually is. Um, so, you know, it, so we're looking at it. We haven't made that determination yet. Okay, and then second, aside from that, there's a lot of great information that you provided on the things we're going to do to try to keep the students and staff safe. Uh, how, have we thought at all about how we're going to promote that back out to the parents so that that may comfort a lot of parents because there's so much good stuff in there? Well, the, the plan that we're talking about is going to be a comprehensive reopening plan that will be published. It will be translated in multiple languages. Um, it will be graphically designed so that it's not just a letter from me that people are going to gloss over and not, you know, so we will have diagrams in it. We will have, uh, you know, graphic examples that, that have been kind of developed by IDPH or CDC. So there will be an extensive district level document that, that is the published version and what we want to be able to, to get out in that middle part of June. In addition to that, we will be doing uh, webinars, um, you know, probably virtual town halls um, well before, you know, probably right in that beginning of August uh, frame. Um, we, I, I have asked our communications team and our instructional technology team to begin to produce 
um, uh, a series of, of training videos, um, both for mm -hmm. kids, parents, and staff. You know, I'm thinking of, um, you know, uh, showing what somebody looks like in PPE so that a five-year-old isn't terrified, <laughs> you know, trying to, to, to give that kind of assurance and, and just, and then also walking people through what this is going to look like. Um, so all of those things are being actively worked on. Um, the videos are, are I, my hope would be that, that by August 1st, um, we, we would be able to have those things produced and, 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 you know, uploaded to our YouTube channel and begin to start promoting those things. Um, but yeah, we, we will be um, blanketing um, in, in every way we can figure out the information to, to get it out to everybody. Good. Bill? Yes. Um, in regard to the use of CARE Act funds, it's likely we're going to have a big expense for substitutes at all levels. Uh, whether a teacher gets ill or needs to be quarantined, a custodial staff member, even a principal may need to are we allowed to use CARE Act funds and will there be enough CARE Act funds to help cover substitutes or is that something that's likely to have to come out of our base budget? Yeah, I mean, we would be allowed to. I will tell you that we, there, there will not be space for it. Um, the 1.038 million that we are getting from the federal government will not cover um, all of the expenses that we are going to incur. Um, one of the things that I do think that we uh, and the board needs to be prepared for is the fact that um, this is going to be expensive. Um, we, I don't have a, a specific dollar amount to give you right now because it is something that we are still working on. Um, but there is, um, you know, a distinct possibility um, that despite presenting a balanced budget, um, that we may end up in a situation where we will need to deficit spend as little as possible, but to make sure that we are adequately and safely and, and effectively addressing this situation. Um, you know, that fund balance that, that this board has been very, very good about building, um, and we have now very healthy fund balances as compared to, you know, even three years ago. You know, in essence, that's a rainy day fund, um, we're in the middle of a hurricane. And so um, I, as, as much as we will try to keep that bottom line in the black, um, it is uh, very likely that we will end up needing to, to deficit spend um, as, as little as we can. Um, and the good news is, is that we ha you have built the, the, the reserves to be able to weather that. Not forever, by the way. <laughs> You know, if we're talking about next year um, and beyond that, then we're going to really need to, um, you know, uh, uh, look very, very closely at, at what our spending uh, pattern will be like in, in future years. Given the possible need for substitutes and the shortage of them, is there any thought of, with all the other temporary hiring you're thinking about doing, hiring some temporary substitutes so we're not caught in a shorthanded situation? Well, we are always hiring substitutes. Um, that is not a process that, that ever stops over the course of the year because we are always in need of substitutes. Um, in the past uh, couple of years, it has been very, very difficult um, to get enough subs, and that has been because we've basically been in a full employment economy. Um, we're not in a full employment economy any longer, and so uh, we may have additional um, resources. Uh, but we never stop hiring. So we will continue to, to, to do that to hire. Thank you. So I, I believe that um, we're having some technical difficulties, uh, and Mike is is uh, working with Phil to try and and um, and you know get that figured out. Um, so are there any other questions right now on CAREC? Okay, obviously I will keep the board updated um, as, we, uh, as we get into our, our next meetings in, in July. Um, and with that, I'm, uh, I've talked about the expansion of PowerSchool uh, in my previous presentation. So that is something that's on the agenda for board action and consent. So I'm not, unless there are specific questions, I'm not going to, to spend any more time on that. Um, and uh, with that then, I think what I'll do is, is I will stop sharing my screen.
Um, and um, I'm not sure if Phil is back with us yet. So I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm taking over your meeting, Phil. Um, but uh, if we wanna go ahead and, and let's have Michael, um, if you wanna give us uh, your summer construction update. Sound, okay. Sounds good. Um, Michael, before you go, uh, all right, I think Phil is back, but if Phil drops off again, that I just want to note for the record that, that you know, um, Stacy uh, Allen will need to, to assume the chair, but Phil, you're back, right? Yes, finally. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm not good sure what Good job. Right, well, so good. where are Fine. we, Mike? We are at the construction update, Phil. So you're back just in time for the excitement. All right, Mike, you got a minute and a half. What's going on, man? <laughs> I will do it. Let, let, let's get through it. So uh, first and foremost, uh, as everybody knows, we have about a $10 million construction spend during the summer. Uh, full day kindergarten and maintenance work is, is basically the summary of that. Uh, we brought on Nicholas and Associates as our construction manager in December. And they have not disappointed between their relationship with Archon as our architect. Uh, our project is on time, ahead of schedule in some parts, uh, in spite of the global pandemic. The only uh, issue that we're keeping our fingers crossed on is the cabinetry in the all-day kindergarten classrooms, because those are being produced in Michigan, and they had been shut down for some time. Uh, we believe they'll be here for the start of school. If not, we will phase them in on weekends and evenings. So what do we have that, that's coming besides those all-day kindergarten rooms and some air conditioning? The big things are renovations at homes. It's basically going to be a new school after this year between lighting, um, the, the work on the air conditioning, uh, just doing a lot of work uh, in the classrooms to get them back up to speed and doing paving and the canopy, which will be the, the showcase of that when you pull up to the building, a lot like Cooper, uh, but doing some really cool things between the brick staining and the panels behind that canopy, which will be, uh, it'll be really awesome when it's done. Uh, Holmes and Hawthorne are also getting some new entryways as far as the drop-off points. Uh, the driveways are getting new paving and some additional uh, work at, at, at Hawthorne to make it more accessible. So. Uh, once we get all that done, we'll be putting schools back together for fall of 2020. Uh, as you know, with the all-day kindergarten rooms, every room has a sink. Uh, some of the rooms, uh, about half of them have restrooms in them. Uh, these are just some of the plumbing upgrades that have been started, and we're well on our way ahead of schedule. We've had plumbing inspections uh, and are really starting to move on those, those rooms, so we will be ready to go in the fall when students return. Uh, we have new walls going up, essentially anywhere where there was an accordion wall uh, in, in those kindergarten spaces, we are going ahead and constructing either a cinder block or a gypsum wall so that we have noise reduction and privacy in those rooms. Uh, we have at Frost, this picture on the right is of the calming room that's being constructed, that in the sensory room so that we have the appropriate separation, appropriate doorways, lighting, all the things that we need to keep our students of their most essential needs uh, safe and, and in a space that, that they can decompress for a little while uh, when they're having a, a moment. So uh, we are also doing a lot of flooring throughout the district. Uh, London is getting a complete makeover, as you know. Uh, that picture on the right is the second, uh, the commons area, the back commons area. Uh, that now is actually complete. I was back there today. This picture was from the morning. Uh, as of this afternoon, me and Mike Trantini took a walk back there, and that floor looks amazing. It's really, uh, it's really making the, not only the hallways pop, but remember the classrooms are getting all new flooring as well. Um, and then on the left is just showing the moisture barrier that we're putting down. And that way we won't have any of the issues that we had in the past with that floor where the tiles pop. So this is a 100% solution to make sure that we are not going back and fixing things in four or eight or 10 years. Uh, mechanical upgrades, Homes obviously is getting the most. Uh, they're getting basically a full upgrade of their rooftop units, uh, getting uh, some new units in the classrooms to make sure that their air conditioning is fully functional. Uh, we, also else, we also have the Targington Gymnasium getting new air conditioning this year, uh, so that's a, that's a big plus over there. 
Um, this is the Longfellow gym floor. All in all, we have two gym floors, Frost and Longfellow, that are getting new Mondo gym floors. Uh, this one is the Longfellow floor. Uh, me and Glenn were over there a couple days ago. It really looks amazing. And again, low maintenance with all of our flooring so that we're not stripping off product, putting new wax down and having that process each year. Truly, this is a, a low maintenance to no maintenance solution that will save us money in the end. So that's a, that's a big plus for us. Uh, we are painting the entire uh, building at Longfellow. Uh, this year, they're on the painting cycle. We also have our six buildings that have the kindergarten classrooms going in. You can see on display the new district palette of colors in these pictures. Uh, so that, that's a, a really positive thing. And we are doing a lot of that painting with our summer work. So a lot of those high school and college kids are there making a huge difference. They did the entryway at London, uh, which truly when that flooring's down and the new entryway's there, uh, it, it's gonna look like a brand new school. Uh, items that we've completed thus far and items that are in progress, as I said, we've got the two gym floors at uh, Frost and Longfellow. We already have completed the uh, four uh, gymnasiums that are getting new lights. That would be Frost, Longfellow, Poe, and Tarkington. Um, obviously, uh, what's not completed and starting in progress, we still have more lighting. Almost the entire, the entire school at Holmes is getting new lighting. That flooring at um, London is, is well on its way, but, but still has probably about three to four weeks to go before completion. Uh, we also have new flooring going into all of the new kindergarten classrooms, as you know. Uh, and then mechanicals are still in progress. That outside paving uh, still being worked on. But I will say, it has been an amazingly smooth summer. Uh, obviously, 10 million is a little bit less than 38 million, but there still is a lot of work that goes into $10 million. And I have to tell you, this presentation, I, I forgot to mention at the start, Glenn was a huge help. I mean, he has been out there still doing his thing, putting pictures on Twitter, making sure that everything is, is going extremely smoothly. Uh, and put together these pictures and much of the presentation without Glenn and his team, we would be well behind the eight ball given what we're facing this year between our response to COVID and having this much construction. So I really do thank, thank Glenn and all the operations, the maintenance, the Codeal staff. So um, what do we have next? Looking ahead to next summer already, because even though we are only about a third of the way through this summer's construction, Obviously, we have good news to celebrate. Today, we closed on the remaining bonds from the referendum. So we are $23.5 million heavier in our capital funds project uh, fund. And so we'll have next year, we'll be doing those remaining kindergarten rooms at the three buildings that are not getting the fixtures this year, just getting the furniture. Uh, we still have some additional mechanical repairs and upgrades, outdoor lighting for security purposes, and then the big one that everyone's been waiting for and was a big centerpiece of the referendum, 21st century furniture upgrades for all our classrooms and learning spaces. That will be done over a period of time. We would love to get it to all of it in one year. Uh, that's obviously not going to happen in one year, but we do have three years to spend those bonds. But uh, Mike and I are assembling the committee. We'll be sending out information soon to start getting people on board so that we could talk about what those 21st century classrooms look like and how we can start spending that money next summer. That's it for me. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank uh, you. Board, board members, any questions for Michael? Yeah, Arlen here. A uh, couple of things, Michael, thank you for the report. Uh, outstanding as always. Uh, Kilmer, has had a leak in the front of the LMC in the past that I've seen and has been reported. Do, have we ever figured out where that's coming from and what we can do about it? So my understanding is Glenn and I walked that building with Matthew and Scott, the head custodian, Matthew, the principal. And my understanding is that leak is not leaking anymore. Um, so my understanding is it has been resolved based upon some work regarding water flow away from the building and some other issues recently. I will go back and check, but I know we had we had talked a little bit about it and my understanding is that it's been resolved. That would be great. Um, and then in turn, I know that uh, lighting is on our agenda. Um, 
will you or somebody else walk all the build the exterior lighting for next year? Uh, walk the buildings to be sure that when we do that, that we cover all. There's a lot of dark areas, obviously, that uh, we've never lit before. But in these days, and in, the, in the kind of world we live in, probably need some light. I'm assuming. Somebody yeah, Arlen, keep in mind that there is going to be an entire design process. This isn't just about replacing lights. Um, Archon and our, and our engineers literally are going to be doing uh, site by site okay. study of where to place. It, it is not simply replacing lights. We have, we have to make sure that the light that we are putting in drops off at a certain That's point. Right, so right. We're minimizing light pollution. Okay. So it is going to be, it's a project. It is going to be a comprehensive um, uh, design process that our, our architects are going to be uh, spearheading. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, and just to add to what Mike said, we obviously have to work with the village too, because this is one of those issues that they do have some say into regarding code. So. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mike, thanks for jumping in on and responding on that one. Any other board members? If I can just re remind board members, if you could hit your raise hand button so I know who's looking to uh, to ask a question or contribute to with a comment, please. Okay. Michael, is there anything else? Uh, no, I'll rejoin you at the last part of the meeting again. Michael, you're still sharing your screen, so if you want to yeah. stop sharing. All right, hold on. Hold on, Zoom. There, oh, there we go. There we go. And stop. No? Oh, I got to go up to the top. Hold on. Am I good? You're good. You're good. Right. Okay. There we go. And we're ready to move into, I believe, public comment. Uh, the board will now receive public comment for up to three minutes. Such comments should not include discussion of personnel matters, which should, of course, be brought directly to the attention of the appropriate school official. I know that we have a number of uh, folks uh, uh, on, on the call tonight. Um, for those of you that are first timers, let me just indicate that as a note to you, we may not, uh, who may not be familiar with our procedure, this is not a question and answer section, the public comment one. It is a listening time for the board to listen to uh, community members. So uh, each person who does wish to speak to us has a three minute time frame to present your thoughts. So um, Mike, if I can ask for some assistance. Yep, Phil, we don't have any, any hands raised. None? Nope. Okay, well, appreciate that. Um, appreciate everybody listening. We now move into the consent agenda section. Um, does anybody need anything pulled from uh, the, uh, the consent agenda? I don't see any board hands. Okay, may I have a motion please? Arlen, your mic's on. Bill Harrison. Second, Stacy Allen. Yeah, I made the motion, Arlen Gould. Okay, uh, Debbie. I think Debbie's other oh, shoes. Yeah, no, my my, inter my my connection was unstable. So, um, Bill. Aye. Jessica. Yes. Stacy Allen. Yes. Myself, yes. Phil. Aye. Arlen. Aye. And Stacy. Yes. Okay. We now move into the next item on our agenda, which is board discussion. Um, Dr. Conley, did you want to start us off on this? So um, one of the things that, that we uh, felt strongly that we wanted to engage in um, as an initial uh, conversation um, is to really begin to discuss our district's role um, in promoting a, an equal, equitable, and, and just society. 
um, the events of the the past eight weeks um, or uh, six weeks, eight weeks, um, but for far too long uh, in our past um, are things that um, you know from a a a, a racial uh, equ uh, equality perspective, um, from a socioeconomic perspective. These are things that have uh, really plagued um, our our country. Um, and as public institutions of public education, we have a, 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 uh, an important role um, in, uh, in addressing those um, and working within our, our community to um, really make sure that, that uh, um, as a country, um, we're living up to what we should be living up to. And so um, with that in mind, um, I, I, you know, Phil and I in, in speaking wanted to, to make sure that we were able to have an initial conversation about um, the direction um, we will be wanting to take um, as a Board of Education and as a district uh, in this very important uh, subject in the, in the weeks and months and years to come. Thank you, Mark. Um, we've received um, in the last week or so, a number of communications from community representatives, our constituents, um, talking to us and suggesting this very thing that we should be concentrating and seriously looking at our, our policies and our practices in regards to um, diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, so uh, we wanted to just have a, a little bit of an opportunity to begin that process. This isn't going to be the final word, quite obviously, uh, on this. Um, and we don't have to spend a tremendous amount of time, but if board members want to share some thoughts at this early stage, let's do so at this point. Bill? We, well, we've had, obviously, those emails and Mike, you've done a great job in responding to them. I say, first of all, between the strategic planning program, as well as Dr. Connolly's intention anyway, we've gotten a step in that direction. Just a first step, we've got quite some ways to go. After doing a little examination, we're doing better than our peers, but that's not saying enough for Bill, we lost your audio. Bob. Those kids. There we go. Um, and I think that that would be an opportunity for us to broaden our reach and increase our diversity as we go forward. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else at this point? Arlen, your mic is off. And his hand's not raised. Um, I agree. and. Uh, as an educational institution, it's really incumbent on us uh, to deal with these kinds of hard issues. And um, there's no question that we've done, I think, a credible job, better than our peers, but there's a lot more to do. And bringing the community along with us is exactly where I think we ought to be. So I'm delighted that the superintendent has brought this as an agenda item for discussion and I'm looking forward to having further discussions about how uh, we can achieve all of this. Thank you, Arlen. Jessica? Uh, I just, uh, I, I know that we put out a communication uh, a couple weeks ago to the community about our commitment to increase diversity in our staff and our schools. And I, I know that that's always been a commitment of the district and I know how much we deeply treasure the diversity in our community. And we'd love to see our professional teaching staff, you know, as much as possible mirror the diversity of our community. Uh, I, I know that we have a plan of action in our strategic plan. I wanna make sure that we're communicating that to our community regularly and as much as possible. I think it would be a great disservice to our community if we didn't raise this issue all the time. If this, this needs to be an ongoing commitment of our district to raise our diversity profile. Uh, and I think the worst thing we can do is just pay lip service to, well, here's our commitment, here's what we're doing. 
and then sort of drop it off. Um, I just, I, I know that our, our families expect that of us and I, I honestly see no reason why we can't be a leader in that regard, like we're a leader in so many other amazing things that we do in education. Uh, so I wanna thank you for putting this on the agenda and I sincerely hope that we have really more in-depth discussions and Q and A's about this, about what we can do uh, as, as frequently as possible going forward. I know many of us have participated in the marches and the protests. And you know, for me and my family, it's been very powerful to be a part of that, to see my community out there, to see them uh, yearning for diversity and respect. And I know that's, that's a role that we can take a significant part in at, as our district moves forward. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Dr. Conlon? Uh, Stacy is raising her hand in, in, on camera. Thank you. I'm having, some, I'm having some technical difficulty with Zoom, so I apologize. Um, the foundation, um, and there are a handful of people on here, the foundation of the family learning program so many years ago was to address deficits in um, in a community-wide acknowledgement of the diversity of this community um, in, in many different forms and conversations. And so um, as we put some of that strategic learning, strategic planning for family learning on the back burner, given what happened second semester, you know, when we got together to have those initial conversations regarding the family learning program, those were some difficult, uncomfortable conversations back then um, where we weren't addressing um, racial disparity head on. We were kind of actually talking right around it. Um, but the fabric of the community has changed a great deal since those initial conversations have. And so in, you know, in one stride, when you go to have those difficult, uncomfortable conversations, the more that you can provide a supportive environment for having those kinds of conversations, um, I think is important. And so we have some, um, some groundwork laid, but the diversity and the robust nature of the community has changed from 15 years ago, even to today. So I think being able to as we look at, at the difficult work and the fascinating work that went on with family learning, although it initially really addressed one population um, and one difficulty, over the years it really blossomed out into um, a conversation on access to education, um, meeting people where they are, and creating spaces in which you can have those conversations. And so I would just um, as we go forward, I think historically, it's always important to look back and see the things that have changed in the, in the district, in the areas that we were successful in having those difficult and uncomfortable conversations and taking the strength of some past work that we've done and being able to push forward. Thank you, Stacey. Bill, did you have something else? I'm just curious. I, like Stacey, I had some Zoom problems. I don't know if any of my comments were heard. Um, so were you able to hear me before? I just got back on again. I had to leave the meeting. Uh, yeah, I believe we, I believe we okay, did. That's fine then. I'm good. Okay. All right. Was there anybody else who hadn't spoken yet or wanted to contribute at this point? So I just wanted to kind of lay out, um, some concrete next steps. Um, my team and I are actively, um, looking at, um, what are the types of things that we need to do to set up the continuing conversation? And so my intention is in your July board meeting um, to bring some of those suggestions. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to get into the preview of the list right now because there's many different things that we are talking about. But I just wanted to, to publicly make the, the commitment that it is my intention to bring back an initial series of, of recommendations of, of how to further this conversation and further this work as we move into our new school year. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Obviously, our this district is a majority minority district. And 
by virtue of some of the more recent uh, hirings that have been done that have shown a, uh, a good solid leaning towards um, uh, increasing uh, the contribution of the minority community as professional staff, I think is a solid indication of where we are heading and the importance of which we place on uh, uh, on that. So we look forward to the continuation, Mike, of that and moving this, moving this conversation uh, forward and continuing to embed it into the culture of District 21. Um, I think we now are ready to move into old business. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of items here. Uh, we go back to Michael. Good evening again. Uh, the first old business item is the approval of the interfund transfer from the transportation fund to the operation and maintenance fund. Uh, we posted for the public hearing uh, after approval at last month's meeting. Uh, so we need to go ahead and, and convene the public hearing on this uh, fund transfer based upon the school code. Okay, may I please have a motion to recess the June 25th, 2020 regular board meeting and convene the public hearing regarding the interfund transfer from transportation fund to operations and maintenance fund. So moved. Was that Stacy? It was Stacy Allen, yes. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. second. Jessica. Thank you. Debbie, if you do a roll call. Yes. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Stacey Allen? Yes. Myself, yes. Phil? Aye. Arlen? He appears to have stepped away from his mo from his computer for a moment. Yes. Uh, okay, Stacy? Yes. And Bill? Aye. Okay. So, Michael? So in, so in brief summary, uh, in past years, as you are aware, uh, we were paying back the loan that was taken uh, uh, by the district from the the education fund or from the to the education fund from the transportation fund, but now since we have finished repaying that loan, uh, we had a surplus in the transportation fund that was ad, it was aided by the fact that we did not have to finish the full year of bus service. Uh, however, based upon the amount of the surplus, we did want to go ahead and transfer about six hundred thousand dollars from transportation fund into the operation and maintenance fund which will then become part of the larger transfer from operations and maintenance into the capital projects fund. As you know, we have a healthy list of items that we need to get to in the district for uh, just our envelope issues, buildings, uh, as far as the roofs, windows, doors, things like that, but we also have 21st century learning. Other things that we wanna start planning for as we embark upon a new 10 year plan. So we're recommending that this transfer be approved tonight of $600,000 from, from the transportation fund into the operation and maintenance fund. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, we are now in the public hearing. Do we have any members of the public who wish to speak at this point? I don't see any hands raised, Mike, do you? No, I do no, we're, we're all set, Phil, there's none. Okay, uh, may I please have a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene our June 25th regular board meeting. So moved, Arlen. Thank you. Second, Stacy Allen. Thank you, Deb. Okay, Stacy Allen. Yes. Myself, yes, Phil. Aye. Arlen. Aye. Stacy. Yes. Bill. Aye. Jessica. Yes. Okay, we are now reconvened into our regular board meeting. Uh, board members, are there any questions for Michael? Seeing none, may I have a motion to uh, approve the interfund transfer? Phil, I'll make the motion. Do I need to read that whole long preamble or can I just read the motion itself? Just read the motion, please. So now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 21. Cook County, Illinois, as follows. The Board of Education hereby finds the recitals contained in the preamble of this resolution to be full, true, and correct, and does hereby incorporate them into this resolution by this reference. Two, the school treasurer is authorized and directed to make a permanent transfer in the amount of $600,000 
from the school district's transportation fund to its operations and maintenance fund, effective June 25, 2020. Thank you, Arlen. May I have a second, please? Second, Bill Harrison. Thanks, Bill. Deb? Okay, Bill, myself, please. yes. Phil? Aye. Arlen? Aye. Stacy? Yes. Bill? Aye. Jessica? Yes. And Stacy Allen? Yes. Okay. I believe we're ready to move on to item B, approval of the amended 2019-2020 budget res resolution. Michael? And we need to recess into another public hearing on this one. Of course we do. May I please have a motion to recess this meeting, our regular meeting and go into a public hearing? So moved, Jessica Riddick. Thank Second, you. Stacey Allen. Thank you, roll call please. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Phil? Aye. Arlen? Aye. Stacy? Yes. Bill? Aye. Jessica? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Allen? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, the board is now recessed on a June 25th regular board meeting for a public hearing on the approval of the amended 2019-2020 budget resolution. We have as there are no substantive Michael. changes, as there are no substantive changes from the amended budget that's been posted for the last 30 days, and the amendments were technical in nature because uh, we we were under budget over the the course of the year. Uh, I won't go through a long presentation, but I will tell you that in July, we will have an updated five-year projection based upon our June 30 closing numbers and based upon uh, information that has been shared with you already regarding the uh, payroll deduction liability in the old, uh, in the audit from FY19 that is actually an asset and fund balance, as well as some other items that our new auditors found. Uh, our fund balances are strong, as Dr. Connolly had said, and are ready to be used, not overused, but used appropriately for the uh, COVID response. So I would ask that you approve the amended budget uh, as presented. Okay. Um, seeing that, do we have any members of the public that have a question during this public hearing? There's seeing, nothing, Phil. Seeing none? Yep. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene our regular June 25th board meeting. So moved, Bill Harrison. Thank you, Bill. Second. Go ahead. We all got it. Second, Go Jessica. Thank you. Deb, uh, roll call. Okay, Arlen. Aye. Stacy. Yes. Bill. Aye. Jessica. Yes. Stacy. Yes. Myself, yes. Phil. Aye. Okay, we now adjourn the public hearing and have gone reconvened our regular board meeting. Or Only to go back question. into another hearing. I'm sorry? <laughs> Only to go back into another hearing. Uh, this is the hearing, the, the Bond Issue Notification yes. Act hearing on the $4.4 .4 million. Oh, did I miss? Wait, Bill, don't shake your head. We've got, we've got to approve the amended budget first. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought we were there. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> Way to go, Michael. Way to go. <laughs> okay. said keep I'm it short. Pass, I'm not passing the gavel yet, Michael. <laughs> uh, board members, assuming there's not any questions for Michael on this one. Yeah. I have a... Uh, a yeah, we do. Uh, we do. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the attached resolution to adopt the 2019-2020 amended budget. Thank you. Second? Second, Stacy Allen. Thank you, Stacy. Debbie? Okay, Stacy? Yes. Bill? Aye. Jessica? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Myself, yes. Phil? Aye. Arlen? Aye. Okay. Now, item C, public hearing concerning the intent of the board to raise 4.4 million working cash bonds to increase our working cash fund. Michael? So we need to recess into another public hearing. <laughs> Very good. So we have a motion to do so, please. So move, Bill Harrison. Thank you, Bill. Second, Jessica. Thank you. Yeah. And Bill? Hi. Jessica. Yes. Stacy. Yes. 
Myself, yes, Phil. Aye. Arlen. Aye. And Stacy. Yes. Okay, we've now recessed our regular board meeting. We're into a public mm -hmm. hearing concerning the intent to issue the 4.4 million working cash bond bonds. Michael, yes, we, do you have anything on that? Um, so the, we have received nothing uh, in the way of any type of objection or anything from the public as, as to date. Um, tonight is a night that we go ahead and, and, and get public comment from both the board and uh, any citizens that wish to come forward. Uh, as part of the financial strategy that we outlined back in March, uh, we issued the $23.5 million remaining on the referendum bonds and due to interest rates, we are looking at uh, issuing $4.4 million in working cash so that we can continue the capital work of the district and getting out in front of the issues, doing preventative items rather than playing catch up and spending more money on the backside. So uh, this is just that time to take uh, a public comment. And then there is no action, which is why I was jumping ahead of myself for the budget. There's no action at the end of this hearing, so. Okay. Are there any members of the public that wish to ask a question? There's no public comment, Phil. Very good, thank you. Board members, are there any questions for Michael on this at this point? May I have a motion then to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene our regular board meeting? So moved. moved. It was at Stacy. I gave it to Stacy. Okay, second. Second, Jessica. Thank you. Um, then. Okay, Jessica. Yes. Stacy. Yes. Myself, yes. Phil. Phil, I didn't hear. Phil. He's frozen on my screen. Yeah. He's frozen on my screen. There he is. There he's back. Oh, Phil. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep, I'm sorry. I'm, my connection is going sort of in and out a little bit also. Okay. Arlen? Aye. Stacy? Yes. And Bill? Aye. Okay. And there's no further action necessary at this point. Now we move into new business. Dr. Conley, would you like to um, comment on the on IMA? Absolutely. So um, very excited to introduce um, my recommendation for our new uh, and, and first uh, Director of Assessment, Analysis, and Accountability. Um, you may have noticed in the in the video grid that, that there's a, a new face that's been kind of, you know, hanging in the background. Um, her name is, is Beatrice uh, Reyes Childress. Uh, and Beatrice is my recommendation, um, very, um, very strong recommendation um, for employment in this position. Um, uh, Beatrice, if you wanted to turn your camera and your mic on, feel free. Um, there you are. Hi. Um, Beatrice um, will be coming to us uh, most recently from her position as assistant superintendent uh, in Aurora School District 131, um, where she spent uh, many years, um, it was a, a principal, a, a director of bilingual services, and finally um, uh, uh, ended her time there as a assistant superintendent. Um, and, you know, I will tell you that that above and beyond all and we had very strong candidates the entire way through the process but above and beyond she distinguished herself as somebody who truly understood and and had just solid experience in organizing and utilizing data um, to guide instructional decision making to guide um, instructional improvement um, she's got extensive experience in program evaluation she uh, it knows her craft um, and she knows um, who we are. Uh, she did extensive research on us. Um, and um, it was, uh, uh, by the end of the process, it wasn't a tough call to make. Uh, it, was a, it was a competitive field, but not a tough call to make. So um, Beatrice, if you wanted to take a moment to introduce yourself, feel free. Yes, thank you, Dr. Conley. Um, good evening, board. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve um, in District 21 in this new role. Um, when I read that job posting, I'm like, 
wow, you got to be kidding me. That's a really forward thinking. Um, and, it, you know, I told Dr. Conley, this job has all the meat and potatoes of what really can help kids move forward in their learning. So I'm really excited about it. And um, the mission and vision of your district tightly aligns with my core values as an educational leader. And I'm looking forward to joining the team and, and working with the staff and the students and community stakeholders. So thank you. Well, so nice to meet you um, at this point. We will look forward to meeting you in person at some point in our future. Absolutely. Um, I'm very happy that even with your extensive research, you still wanted to join us. So that's <laughs> both about you as well as us, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, board members, may I have a, uh, a motion to approve the employment agreement? for the Director of Assessment Analysis and Accountability. So moved, Arlen. Thank you. Second? Second. Jessica. Thank you. Deb? Okay, Stacy Allen. Yes. Myself, <laughs> yes. Phil? Aye. Arlen? Aye. Stacy? Yes. Phil? Aye. And Jessica? We, just we can see you, but we can't Jessica. hear you. Raise your hand, Jessica. Uh, <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> Two thumbs up. I like that. Teachers, welcome to District 21. Thank you. I'm so excited to be joining your team, and I look forward to meeting you all in person. And we do welcome. So. We are as well. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome again, Beatrice. We look forward to seeing you in person. Um, and the good work that you're gonna be doing with Mike and the rest of the professional staff there. Um, moving on to item B, transfer of funds from operation and maintenance to capital projects, Michael. Simply put, uh, this is a combination of the $600,000 we just transferred into the O&M fund, as well as the $1.1 million that we are transferring from operations and maintenance into uh, capital projects for a total of $1.7 million. Thank you. Any questions for Michael? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the attached resolution authorizing a transfer of $1,700,000 from the Operation Maintenance Fund to the Capital Projects Fund, effective June 25, 2020. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Stacy Allen. Thank you, Stacy. Debbie? Okay, myself, yes. Phil? Aye. Arlen? Aye. Stacy? Yes. Bill? Aye. Jessica? Yes. And Stacy? Yes. Last item under new business, uh, item C, interfund transfers of revenue for capital leases. Michael again. Uh, yes, and so this is an item that will disappear. Uh, it was supposed to disappear after this year. There's a GASB regulation that is going to take out the need to distinguish capital leases from operating leases. However, and they've extended that for a year. So until we hit that point, um, we have to do this transfer one more time. This basically takes the two operating or the two capital leases that we have in the Ed Fund and one in the Operations and Maintenance Fund and requires us to transfer those dollars into the Debt Service Fund where capital leases have been taken out of. So we recommend the transfer of these monies two resolutions you can take them simultaneously or individually uh, however you wish i think we would like to take them um, simultaneously if we could yeah i have them listed simultaneously okay if there's not any questions for michael if we can take them to have the motion please bill do you want to do it oh why not yes he does <laughs> Be <laughs> resolved, the Board of Education authorizes the interfund transfers of revenue from the Education and Operations and Maintenance Funds to the Debt Service Fund for the fiscal year 2020 for capital leases per the associated resolutions. Thank you, Bill. Second? Second, Jessica Reddick. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Phil? Nope, you froze again, Phil. Raise your hand, Phil. Thumbs up. Why don't you come back around to him? Yeah, come back around. Yeah. Arlen. Aye. Stacy. Yes. 
Bill. Hi. Um, Jessica. Yes. Stacy. Yes. Myself. Yes. Phil. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Hi. 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 Before we, I move. I have request a motion to adjourn. Dr. Conley, mm -hmm. are we planning for the July 16th next board meeting to be in person or virtual again? Uh, a hybrid um, as, as the situation warrants, but yes, um, we, as long as we are in phase four um, and we can accommodate up to 50 persons in a space, um, we will have a, um, a live component we will also continue to offer um, board yeah. members um, the ability to remote in, um, you know, f uh, to uh, cater to their own um, uh, uh, personal situations. Um, yes, so absolutely. Um, okay. And I did have one more celebratory um, and, and recognition that I wanted to do very quickly. Okay. Um, today was the first day of our fresh produce um, uh, uh, Yes. A pickup program uh, through the uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository, and oh. we had, a, I think, 410 cases wow. of news, um, that we will have every single Thursday. Um, and uh, uh, Cara Beach and Melissa Margese have been pivotal, not just with this, but also with our entire Friday food pantry that we were doing throughout May and into June. Um, we had um, a little bit of a traffic problem um, because of the, uh, of the flow coming into the London uh, parking lot. Um, uh, cars were lining up at 1130. Uh, distribution wasn't scheduled to begin until 1230. Um, and um, we were uh, out um, within, I, I believe, a little less than two hours. Mm -hmm. um, we've learned some lessons from today about um, the need and the uh, amount of, of traffic that will be coming through. So we're looking at our, our system and, and reaching out willing to, to try and see if we have traffic support because we've caused a little bit of a, of, of a traffic jam on, on Dundee um, and we would like to try and not do that again. Um, but in any event, I just really wanted to make a, a special note for Cara and, and in particular who was out there today coordinating all of it um, and, um, uh, and keeping cool and calm while she was doing it because it was a little chaotic. Um, and then also uh, Melissa, um, who uh, was working very hard on this. And this will continue um, for the foreseeable future. Right. This is not necessarily something that is, it doesn't have a, a defined end date. Um, so as evidence, I, by, by, as evidence by what we saw today, there is an absolute need. Right. Well, great job. I drove through the traffic extravaganza today. Um, and is there a way to have a conversation with the village to see if there's a way to do, like, I'm thinking like even back behind, like, the park district where you have that big lot or something. I I couldn't get down Dundee Road today in the middle of it. So well, we are going to have the conversation, but I do think that we can accommodate it on the London site. It's just a matter of how we set up that parking lot to be able to utilize multiple lanes, multiple stations, and kind of. So it's just more of a design. So okay. we're going to give it one more week and and uh, and put those things in place. And then going into week uh, three, if we need to, to move to an alternate site that is not in such a high traffic area, we will absolutely do so. And I just wanted to thank the village of Wheeling. Dave Vogel had reached out to me to make some donation. They had some stuff donated. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned um, Dave Vogel and Wheeling Helping Hands reached out. They had some candy, but they were very interested to know what we were doing and um, to get more information. So I just wanted to make sure I thanked him publicly for that. Okay, very good. Mike, good news. Uh, may I now have a motion and a second for the adjournment of our regular board meeting on June 25th? So moved, okay. Jessica Riddick. Thank second, you. Stacey Allen. Thank you. Okay, and Stacy Allen. Yes. Myself, yes, Phil. Aye. Arlen. Aye. Stacy. Yes. Bill. Aye. And Jessica.
<laughs> we have a yes okay, that you. works. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's been an interesting meeting tonight. Good night, all. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Mike.